Hello and welcome to Voices of Vic podcast with me, Mike Duffy, and as always, Ben Aiton. Ben, how are you doing this Saturday morning? Yeah, I'm all right, mate. You've, you let me have a bit of a line today. Um, so, been. yeah. Um, yeah, all good here, though. How are you? Yeah, very, very good. Thank you. We're edging closer to the start of the EFL Skybet Championship season. I believe it is three weeks today. Uh, two weeks for some clubs with the EFL Cup, uh, Carabao Cup, sorry. But uh, three weeks today, Ben, it felt like yesterday we were relegated at Arsenal. Yeah, it just came around so quickly, hasn't it? I, I can't believe it. A I few weeks ago, we were getting though. relegated at Arsenal, and now we're, we're looking to play our first game of the season in a few weeks' time. It's, exactly. it's mad, isn't it? Exactly. Well, I tell you what, Ben, you've bridged that perfectly, because that's where we're starting, mate. We're starting at the fixture list. We're starting with fixtures that were released yesterday at 9am. Uh, if you haven't seen them, where have you been? We're going to run through them anyway, because personally, I think we've got quite a tough opening seven fixtures. And usually people say uh, opening three, opening five, but seven is a bit of an odd number. But I just think there's some tough ones in there. Right. So, um, firstly, as I've just said, the EFL Cup or the Carabao Cup starts on the 5th of September. And as some may be aware, some may not be aware, because Watford finished 19th, uh, 20th goes through to the uh, goes into the first round draw for the Carabao Cup, but 18th and 19th receive a bye. I don't know why, but I'm not going to complain because we usually do crap in the Carabao Cup anyway. Uh, so we'll just wait till round two to get knocked out by uh, Harrogate Town, for example. Um, but we have actually scheduled a behind closed doors friendly at Vicarage Road against Tottenham Hotspur. So that's going to be on the 5th of September. Um, just I would imagine to get experience because other teams will have played on that and they can sort of take the momentum into the games I, I would imagine that's possibly why they've done it Yeah. we then start with Middlesbrough at home on the 12th of September Sheffield Wednesday away on the 19th of September Luton Town at home surprise, surprise, surprise I mean nobody was surprised that they were going to put the Luton game because it's going to be behind closed doors I would be very surprised if they let fans in for that one yeah, uh, and, and that's at home. And then we go to Reading on the 3rd of October. Possibly for that one, I think Boris has sort of hinted that maybe fans will be allowed in in October. I know there was an article about uh, Premier League grounds not letting fans in this season, but I don't know what the ruling would be for the Championship. I would imagine if they can't have them in the Prem, I would imagine it would be the same for the, uh, for the Championship and below as well. Um we then take another away trip, back-to-back away trips, the first of the season, to Pride Park and play Derby County. And let's hope that Wayne Rooney has another horror game because that was a game he actually said in an interview when he left Man United that that was a game that he knew it was over for him at Man United when we beat them 3-1. So let's hope he has another horror game. And then we have our first midweek fixture. It's not the championship without midweek fixtures. A Wednesday night home game against Blackburn Rovers. And how I remember what I'm about to say, I do not know. But the last time that we played Blackburn at home in the week, we won 1-0 and Igalo scored. It was the scrappiest goal ever and the scrappiest game in the world. Um, and then the seventh fixture on the 24th. So a quick turnaround, just three days later, we faced Bournemouth at home. Um, so a tough seven fixtures there, Ben. Do, do, do you agree with me? Yeah, it is. Um <laughs> I really struggled to get excited yesterday. The fixture release day isn't the same when you can't plan away days or even step in s- foot inside the Vic, is it? Um, so really struggled. Mm. Um, so just try and get my head around that. But yeah, the football fixtures are out now. Um, the rebuilding has already started behind the scenes. A few players have gone out. So now we can start planning um, for that first game of the season. The Spurs game behind closed doors is a great opportunity for those players to get um, some minutes in his legs. Um, otherwise, we would have played catch up because, like you said, twentieth um, place Norwich are playing in the Carabao Cup, so they'll they'll be playing a week before us. So yeah, it's a great decision that we're doing. Um, Spurs behind closed doors. Um, so we're here on a level playing field. Um, but yeah, it's, it's exciting to see the fixtures come out and when we're playing them. I guess um, I've, I've made note that there's actually fourteen midweek league games excluding Easter for what for next season. There's six at home and eight away. And we oh, love a we love a midweek oh, game, don't we? We do love a midweek game. It'd be even better if we could go, but yeah, we love a midweek game, Ben. We really do. 
and it's, it's interesting to plug the podcast though. yeah definitely <laughs> and it's interesting to see the whole Luton Town game behind closed doors as well you, you knew it was going to happen the FA yeah. uh, uh, EFL would have wanted um, this to be played behind closed doors just to try and limit the trouble but obviously it's going to maybe occur on that day uh, but it, I do find it quite funny that Luton's biggest game in a decade would be behind closed doors yeah yeah, they've made quite a quite a scene. But to be fair, like you know, I, I do envy other fans in that sense. And I, I'm not for one minute claiming that this is a massive, massive derby because, to be quite frank, that's not even the closest football team to us. I don't think. But um, you know, the likes of my mates, uh, they've got the Villa Blues derby, and like on the derby day, like the whole atmosphere around Birmingham, you can just tell it's derby day. So I do envy like having that derby, but. Yeah, it, it, it was always going to be behind closed doors. Yeah. Uh, but as we've said, we, we kick off the season at home to Middlesbrough. Yeah. And uh, a new feature that we've got, me and Ben have decided, we're going to be speaking to opposition fans uh, whenever we play them. And obviously, with it being Middlesbrough, we thought we'll start with a Middlesbrough podcast. And earlier today, we spoke to Dana from the Borough Breakdown podcast. And here's what was said. <laughs> Yes, as mentioned, uh, I am joined, me and Ben are joined by Dana from the Borough Breakdown podcast. Uh, it's a new feature that we've got going on. So this season, whenever we're coming up playing against somebody, we're going to be interviewing an opposition fan, preferably a pro- podcast. And we've, uh, we've got just that in uh, the form of the Borough Breakdown. Uh, f- thanks for joining us, Dana. No problem. No problem. Good stuff. Um, well, I, I must say, ladies and gents, this is the second take at this because I forgot to record the first one. So, yeah, bear with me on this. But um, start at the beginning. You So far, you've brought in Grant Hall and he's had five years at QPR, worked with Neil Warnock previously as well at the, in those um, years at QPR. And then on the other end of the scale, you've let go of George Friends, who's also followed an ex Borobos in the form of Karanka and he's mm. gone to Birmingham City. Two very, very experienced, especially in the Championship, players. So how do you feel bringing someone like Hall in will do compared to letting someone of George Friend's stature go? Do you, do you think it will sort of balance itself out or do you think Grant Hall's a better proposition than uh, George Friend or, or what, what's your general feel around those two players? Well, I mean, it was always going to happen that we were going to let George Friend go um, eight years at the club. It's it's sad to see him leave. But yeah, we, we have gained a leader in, in Grant Hall. Um, it's a good signing. It's a signing, which, you know, we've been struggling to, to get players over the line this summer. But um, yeah, I mean, we still need more. We lost a lot of players. A lot of that core of the, the, the Aitor Karanka days, actually, with um, Ayala and uh, friend and Clayton as well. We lost uh, Gusted and Ryan Shotton as well. So you know, there's a lot of, of championship experience there that, that's gone that we need to we need to replace. So although yeah, we've we've gained uh, another leader there uh, and, and another um, player with championship experience in Grant Hall. We we definitely need a lot more than than what we have. Is there anybody that you've got you've been heavily linked with or anything, to, and you're looking to get close, like get it over a line? I know previously you've had Ben Gibson at the club, and he's been training with you since January, since he fell out with um, Sean Dyche at Burnley. Is that something you're looking to get over a line? Um, yeah, the the club are obviously trying quite hard for for Ben Gibson. Um, our chairman is is his uncle, so there's obvious obvious borough ties there, but. Um, yeah, it's it's been a frustrating window so far, actually, because we've had a lot of links, a lot of players that we've put bids in for. We had two bids knocked back for Charlie Good, who uh, just recently signed for, for Brentford. Um, we had an approach for Joe Williams of, of Wigan. Um, he's just signed for Bristol City. And then uh, we also had Luke Amos, who was heavily linked with us, and then he signed for QPR. So a lot of Borough fans are frustrated. They're, they're very impatient. And um, it's just been a, a familiar pattern of our, our window, really. I think the only reason really why we got Grant Hall in is because of those ties that you mentioned um, with Neil Warnock, uh, briefly played with him um, when he was caretaker at QPR. So that's probably the, the main factor in why Grant Hall came here. But we've, we've really struggled to get players over the line. And um, if, if Ben Gibson does come, it's, it's brilliant, but it is a difficult deal to get over the line because um, Sean Dyche is, is not 
<laughs> gonna let him go anytime soon we're gonna have to start hashtag uh, free Ben Gibson again like Borough fans did a couple of weeks ago so it's it's a difficult deal to get over the line because of, of that and wages so we'll see where that goes but um, we definitely need to look beyond Ben Gibson I think yeah just talking about last season you obviously finished 17th in the end uh, five points clear of the drop zone uh, how big an impact we you touched on Neil Warnock earlier how big an impact has that man been because we all know what experience he brings you know his vast experience in the championship of getting teams up um, keeping teams up um, just just what experience has he brought firstly and then secondly if he hadn't come in do you think it was only one way and it was down under Woodgate yeah, definitely. Um, I remember we titled one of our podcasts, um, it's beginning to look like relegation and then the only way is down. And there was a definite feel of just resignation really from Borough fans that, that it was inevitable um, under Jonathan Woodgate. So the fact that we brought in Neil Warnock to really steady a sinking ship was a good decision from Steve Gibson. And he's just really brought the basics back into play because I think we'll get tried too hard to overcomplicate things you know he wanted that that high press that attacking style and it just never materialized I think he wanted too much too soon um and we'll get um he, he just failed with that and, and Warnock came in um and he's he's done a good job really I think the fact that he came in and I mentioned this on our podcast the fact that he's there to start with is confidence in itself because he's got that experience like you mentioned and he's got a great record of getting teams out of trouble so that in itself really helped Borough. Um, he still couldn't help our woeful home form. We haven't actually won a game at the Riverside in 2020, which is, is pretty dismal. So he still has that to rectify. But, um, you know, we are well placed, I think, with, with Neil Warnock in charge. It's interesting to know because me and Mike have spoken a few times. I think even on our last podcast, we've mentioned Middlesbrough. And we've, we've actually tipped you for like a top 10 finish this season. So that's interesting to know all of that. Um, having worn up for a full season, could you reap some benefits from it? Um, what are your realistic like, hopes and ambitions for the season ahead? Oh, top 10 would be brilliant. But I think for me, I said it um, on our season review podcast, podcast that I just want to see us progress I just want to see us improve and um, it would be a significant improvement um, on on last season if we were to score more goals uh, if the defence was to become a little bit more watertight if we were to have a little bit more creativity in midfield I know it's it, it sounds like a lot when you list it out but it really is the the bread and butter of football that's what I want to see um, next season league table standings don't really matter to me because I know that we're not going to be aiming for the playoffs um, as much as some of our players want to come out and say that that is the aim I don't think it quite is realistic so um I think it's for me if we are going to place a um you know a league standing on it mid table I'd take mid table just as long as we're not in the mess that that we were in last season because at one point I genuinely did think that that we were going down and and, and Borough, Borough simply can't be in league 1 it, it it just doesn't make any sense Yeah you know talking of you know hopes and ambitions for this coming season um start the season away at Watford hence why you're on are you uh, are you feeling confident? You know, I, I know that the your, your records at Vicarage Roads probably isn't the best, but you know, passes you new and whatnot, and Neil Warnock f- full season. You, you feeling confident? And then, do you, if you don't mind giving us a little score prediction as well, please. Yeah, I was looking into our record. One win in five there. Um, I believe the the game that we won. I think Scott McDonald um, came off the bench and scored. Um, it was. I went the cold um, in that in that run up. I think um, Tony Mowbray pretty much banished him, and then he came back and he scored. So um, that would be a good a good scoreline. Um, you know, two one. I think that game was. I, I would take that, but I'm not confident. I, I don't particularly feel very confident about going uh, to Vicarage Rose. There's just something about it. I think it's. I'm scarred from that uh, the playoff season that we had, uh, <laughs> where we went to Vicarage Road, and I just remember Jonathan Wood and Dwight Tindale had absolutely awful abysmal games there um, and really I think the score could have been more than what it was at, 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 on that day so it's it's a fixture that fills me with dread um, I just think that you know you can score goals and, and we can't we, we just it's not ingrained in, in our DNA to, to score goals we never have I don't think we ever will be a, a goal scoring team so um, I'm not confident I think 
for some reason, 3-1 just keeps entering my head. So, unfortunately, I have to go for that. But um, good scoreline for you if that, yeah. if that happens. Yeah, but, we um, start off with a 3-1 win. We won't be complaining, will we, Ben? Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely take that. But you never know. <laughs> Watford struggled to find a back of a net last season as well. Yeah. And, and with some players going out our end as well, we, we don't know what kind of squad we'll be left with um, this season as well. So, who knows? I think it's a free-for-all, really, first game of the season. Teams mm. have just gone down from a championship, uh, from the Premier League as well. Um, so we might be low on confidence. So it's probably the best time for a Middlesbrough to play against us. And um, from a, a Middlesbrough point of view, uh, who are Watford's danger men to look out for? Uh, the, the main player that pops into my head is, is obviously Troy Deeney. He's got that championship experience. He's a, a goal scorer at this level. He's a big physical presence. He, he causes problems for any defence in this division. So I think obviously Troy Deeney but you've, you've also got a lot of experience all over the pitch a lot of flair a lot of pace and a lot of creativity which is something that we lack so if you could maybe lend us one or two of your players that would be brilliant but um <laughs> no I, you know Troy Deeney is, is is the obvious player for me that that stands out um Decore power in midfield um which is a, a, again what we need um you know, there's a lot of players. Sa, if he stays, which he, he probably won't. He's been linked with a move away. I know Delafeu has been quoted as saying that he, you know his time at Watford is done. But even beyond that, you've got you've got good players, and, and even if you can keep hold of uh, a couple of them, um, it's that creativity that really flourishes in the Championship if the players are really committed and, and have their heads in in the right place. Um, but I think definitely Troy Deeney is is the danger man for me. Yeah, before we talk about our danger man for Middlesbrough, you mentioned about lending you a couple of players. I know just the man, Andre Gray, you can have him. I'll drive him there. I'll <laughs> you know what, we, we, would <laughs> we, honestly, <laughs> we would take him. We Honestly, we would take him. You, you, can he play centre-back? He, he, he can't play striker and that's his position, so I'm not so <laughs> sure, to be honest. Uh, We're not doing any refunds, Steve, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think the obvious one that sticks out for us, and it's only because of his past time at Watford, you know, we, we, we let him go. He was seventh, seventh choice striker, sold him to Peterborough in the end. It's got to be, uh, it's got to be Brit Sumbalonga, hasn't it, Ben? Uh, yeah, I'll take British on Belonga. And also, um, there's a few Watford fans might recognise this name as well. We've been linked with him before in the past, a young winger, uh, Marcus Travenier. Um oh, I think he sure. started a lot of games for you. Um, last season, I think he's got three goals last year. Um, so yeah, he, he's, he's a young player and would have fitted our um, the team really well. Um, I think he's pacey. Um, so yeah, I will have one eye on him because you, you you're always linked with players, aren't they? And then you always play against the team and they always turn up and perform, don't they? So I will have yeah. one eye on him as well. And the only other one I'd have because our defence was absolutely woeful last season, and he's quite a big guy. Is Ashley Fletcher. He, um, hmm. he he's one that sticks out in, in my mind because you know he he can get goals. Um, I don't know how well he's been playing for you recently, but yeah, he he's definitely one that sticks out just from looking out from the outside looking in. Yeah, it's it's a good pick, Fletcher, because he's had the best season of his career at Borough. Um, he's he's been criticised quite quite heavily um, since his move from from West Ham because of the price tag, because of the the fee that we paid for him. We paid seven million pounds. Um, for him uh, from West Ham so it, it's always going to be an uphill battle when you have that figure above your head but he's, he's slowly starting to repay that uh, that price tag he's still got a long way to go of course but um, a very very good season last season quite surprised actually and, and um, pleasantly surprised at that because I wasn't expecting it from him but our top scorer with 11 goals I think outscored British on Belonga and he looks like a completely different player he looks like he's got his mojo back um, he's, he looks confident he looks happy playing football I was listening to a podcast and um, where he was talking about his his mental health um, when he went to Sunderland and and you could just tell that his confidence was depleted um, in that team that got relegated from the championship um, it's always going to be tough to to sort of get going there in that sort of environment so it's good to see him firing on all cylinders and, and long may it continue for us. Yeah no, very interesting point about uh, Ashley Fletcher the quite noticeable in the uh, the first Sunderland documentary I think it was because that was the one when they got relegated so it'd be mm. interesting to see how he does this season hopefully he doesn't do very well against us but he can do <laughs> well against the rest of the league for all I care um, especially Luton yeah yeah <laughs> yes please no, uh, uh, Sunderland longer scored against Luton last season I think that's when he led it through I think he might have missed a penalty as well no, he, yeah he blazed a penalty over the bar yeah yeah that nearly went out of it's so small yeah well 
I think a uh, tipping over the bar could go out there, ground bed. Um, <laughs> lastly, thank, first, lastly, thanks for coming on. You know, really appreciate it. No, no problem. We, we, we're going to be asking every fan this, as we said at the top of this interview, we, we're going to be speaking to um, every fan, uh, well, almost every fan. I'm sure you can guess which team we're not going to be speaking to. But, um, <laughs> yeah, every fan that comes on. So you're the first to be thrown under the, uh, the bus, I'm afraid. Um, we would like to know your three to go up and three to go down starting with three to go up please three to go up i'd i'd say watford um <sighs> probably see so yeah, the thing i'm thinking is that bournemouth could go either way they could either do a huddersfield and store from this season and and struggle mm-hmm. or they could go up because you know the narrative of, of plucky little Bournemouth, they might just sneak in there. But um, and the Russian billionaire say... owner as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> plucky little Bournemouth with a Russian billionaire owner. But um, no, I'd say I'd say Bournemouth yourselves and probably Brentford. They'll be looking to avenge that that playoff final defeat, similarly to to when we uh, lost the Norwich and then went up um, the season after. So I'd, I'd say them three, and then the teams to go down um, with that points deduction. Sheffield Wednesday. Um, I would love to see Sheffield Wednesday go down anyway because I hate Gary Monk. Um, and then Luton and Three. Three. <laughs> yeah, coming on again. <laughs> Luton and uh, probably Wickham. I think Wickham are issuing without being disrespectful. Um, I think they're nailed on to go down next season. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they do because they've they've not really brought anyone in. I think they've brought one player in. Um, who played for QPR, but for the life of me, I can't think of his name. Other than that... They also signed for the ex-Watford player. Yeah, Uche, Uche Pizu. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so he's definitely going to score against us. There's another one to go against Watford. Uh, and they have the best third goalkeeper kit in the whole of the division. Oh, yes, um, they do. Closely they do. second to Bristol City, who released theirs yesterday. Um, yes, that's very nice. Yeah. But, yeah, no, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, we really no do problem. appreciate it. You guys... Go check them out. We'll pop the link uh, to the Borough Breakdown podcast in the um, tweets that we'll put out today. Um, I'm sure we will speak again when the reverse fixture comes round, and we, we wish you the very best for the season, other than the first home, first game of the season and then the reverse of eye fixture as well, uh, which we never seem to win at the Riverside anyway, so I'm sure you'll be all right from that side of things. But, yes, thank you very much for coming on, being the first fan, uh, opposition fan on Voices of the Vic, and hopefully not the last as well. So, yeah, thank you very much for coming on Dana. Thank you for having me. I'm honoured to be the first uh, opposition fan. I'll put that on my CV. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> You'll get all the Brilliant. Job. Cheers Dana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a, uh, an interview there with the Borough Breakdown podcast. Uh, thank you very much for coming on Dana. But Yes, uh, they're the fixtures out of the way, Ben. You know, we, we, we know who we've got now. We, we yeah. know the midweek games. They're going to be coming thick and fast, just like these podcasts, uh, which I can't wait for. Let's actually talk about who we've actually got in terms of the squad now, because we know the fixtures. We now need to know what we're working with squad-wise. So if you haven't seen it already, ladies and gents, Adam Leventhal put out a report um Last week, I want to say, I can't remember exactly when, just sort of giving an update as to the returning players from loans, because, uh, you know, we had quite a few players out on loan, um, you know, more than I sort of knew that we had. And um, a lot of big name players as well that a lot of Watford fans are excited to see return. And he's sort of just given an update as to what's going on with them. So just to just to run through them all. So firstly, we, we I think we touched on him briefly last week. We've got the 22-year-old Luis Suarez, the, uh, returning from his loan spell at Zaro, uh, Real Zaragoza, where he scored 19 in 38 appearances. Pretty tidy, Ben. And, uh, you know, 22 as well. And he was very, very highly rated over in the Liga. So how big an opportunity is this for him this season to, to sort of write his name in, in Watford folklore and maybe help get us back up? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, he, he's a massive player for us this season. I think he's going to be one of the first names on the team sheets. Um, he's been linked with massive moves um, to bigger clubs as well. Uh, Atletico Madrid, for example, have had, 
have an eye on Suarez. Uh, Watford have put a 50 million euro price tag on his head, though. Uh, so I imagine that's going to knock him back. Um, but yeah, Suarez arrived back on the 5th of August. Um, hence why we've seen him in a Watford training top now, which came out Friday night on the Watford Twitter page. Um, but yeah, he, he's a massive player for us this season. He, he can he can score left foot, right foot. He, he, he's a bit like a um, Rottweiler. Um, he's yeah. very aggressive from the front. He chases everything down and... It, I've, I've had a look at some of his goals this season um, and he scored about three or four goals by chasing down the keeper and chasing down the defender and winning the ball back and just passing it in the back of the net. So it would be, I think that's the kind of striker you need in a championship. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we've, we've had some real sort of powerhouses before and some players with some absolute engines on them, you know, uh, Matty Vidra comes to mind, but, you know, to, to have someone that chases a ball down, he's very physical, aggressive, sort of like a younger version of Troy Deeney when he was younger and the, the year we come up, that's what he did. He bullied people about. So it's going to be interesting to see just how easily Luis Suarez or, uh, will actually slot into the Watford side. Um, another 22-year-old, which we've got coming back. Uh, and there's been a little bit of sort of um in and ah because of something that's been said on social media, but I think... It may have been taken out of context, I don't know, is Purvis Estupinen, I believe I pronounced that correctly. He's returning from a loan spell in La Liga as well with Osasuna, where he played 36 games scoring just the once, um, which for a left-back, you know, we're not expecting him to score. But yeah. I think the real... The, the, what I'm about to say sort of outlines how well he's done. Man United and Barcelona were, and probably still are, said to be interested in him. Like... You can't get two bigger clubs, and he's not even played a game for Watford yet. And just like how well do you have to do to actually attract the likes of those two two teams? And and if we can keep him, then it's going to be massive, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be absolutely huge. Um, I, I've only I've not really seen much of the kid. Um, I think I've seen him play at the New Camp. Um, when it was locked down, and he provided an assist down the left hand side. He looks very. Um, very quick going forward and he's got a good delivery on the, off the ball. Um, I think he's going to be massive for us this season. He he could potentially be one of the best left-backs that we have in a Watford shirt. He, he could be up there with like the likes of Paul Robinson. Um, so, yeah, ma- yeah, massive um, shout for me. But, um, yeah, I think it's great and it's just... It's a new era, isn't it, under the Pozos now? And I think they're showing it. We've said bye to the likes of Gomez, Mariapa, Holobas and there could be potential of more outgoings and we're showing him ambition by trying to keep these returning loanees who've been earmarked by other giant clubs in Europe. Yeah, well, Ben, has he hinted a move away? And the reason I ask you this, and I'll read you what he said, he did an interview with Diario Extra. Yes, I don't know who they are either. Uh, And I'll read you what he said. He said, I am back in England. The owner of my contract is Watford. And I have to start working with them until I see what happens with what he's heard. Um, That is handled by my agent with the owners. But in a few days, everything will be clear. Now, I mean, this is this was translated because when it was originally put out, I believe it was put out in in a different language. So firstly, there could be some translation problems. Uh, but secondly, it could be taken out of context. Do you, do you think, just off the back of what I've just said, do you think he's maybe got one eye on moving away, especially with these big clubs knocking at the door, or do you just think it was lost in translation? Yeah, exactly that. I was going to say that. Um, I think it's been lost in trans- translation. Obviously, he's an ambitious boy. He wants to play at the very top, but he's got a contract with Watford. I think he's going to honour that contract. Um, I think we're going to see at least a season out of him before he moves on to bigger and better things if Watford don't get promoted. Yeah, very, very interesting We're uh, to, to keep an eye on those developments. Hopefully we do keep hold of him. Um, from left back to right back, we've got the 25-year-old Mark Navarro. He's going to be returning from um, quite an unimpressive loan, actually, uh, where he was at Leganes, where he only made four appearances. And in the end, Lagarde is actually relegated from the Liga. So, with, with him at right back, we've got uh, Ngakia at right back. We've got Daryl Yamma at right back. Um, and we've got Kiko Femenia as well. But he looks like he might be after Spain. Um, do you think Mark Navarro can slot in very quickly, Ben? Or? Uh, I see Mark Navarro as possibly a backup. Um, I, I yeah. don't really see him starting. Uh, not really seen much of him in a Watford shirt. I think he's had a few appearances. I remember that he's 
he started at the Emirates, didn't he, for us for one game? He did, yes. um, but yeah, he he's versatile as well, though. He can play on the left. So if there's any injuries on the left, he can maybe fill in over there. But yeah, I imagine it's Ingaki is going to start. Um, maybe if Yamat sticks around, if not, I just see him being back back up. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's fair, and I would like to see Daryl Yamat stay because I think he could do a job in the championship. I think he would play second fiddle to Jeremy and Gakia, which would maybe see that Mark Navarro would leave. But I think that's very fair. Uh, moving on to the next gentleman that's actually returning from loan is twenty three year old. And I bet a lot of people forgot he was even still a Watford player. Uh, and I only remembered because I saw him in a video. He's 23-year-old Jerome Sinclair. He's returning from what seems an unimpressive loan spell at VVV Venlo in the Eredivisie. He played 23 times but didn't score once. Um, so, And just to put into perspective, he's had four loan spells since joining Watford. He's made a total of 57 appearances and he's only scored four goals. Do you think his time's up now, Ben? Do you, do you think, right, we'll just sell him to maybe League One, League Two? Or, or do you think, no, you know, maybe you'd start him? Or, or is that just completely out of question? Yeah, I think that's completely out of the question. I don't think he's good enough to be in and around the first team. Uh, those stats don't lie. He, he's, he's a striker and he hasn't scored goals. Um, he, he went on loan to Sunderland a year or two ago. He, he was pretty poor there, I think. Obviously, with with I think most fans have watched that documentary on Netflix with uh, the Sunderland, and yeah. he's been on there. And I don't think fans really warmed to him uh, when he started. Um, they had another young striker coming through from the academy, and he performed better than Jerome Sinclair. So I think it's time that maybe we release him, or if a club was keen to pick him up, try and get something out of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know, if a club comes in, I think we just accept it. But the likelihood of a club coming in when he's scored four goals in 57 appearances in four loan spells doesn't make for good reading. Um, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens with Sinclair. Uh, and then we, we, we're we literally just going to touch upon him very, very quickly because we talked about him at length in uh, last week's podcast. But Ben Wilmot returning from a very impressive loan spell at Swansea. He played 21 times, scoring twice, one of which was a winners against the winner against Cardiff City. So I'll tell you what, he would have really impressed the Swansea fans. And uh, unfortunately, he did suffer an injury towards the end of his loan spell, which actually cut his loan spell short and he missed the playoffs, which is a shame. But we, we, we touched it at length last week, Ben, but we're really looking forward to seeing him play this season, aren't we? Yeah, really excited to see him playing week in, week out. Like you say, he played 21 games at Swansea. Uh, he would have played more if it wasn't for his uh, injury um, that stopped him playing towards the end of the season. But yeah, really excited to have him back in the Watford shirt. Yeah, no, completely agree. So they're the players that are coming back in. Now, let's flip the coin and look at the other side of things. The players that are going out. So... We've recently heard that Passetto was having a medical, I believe it was yesterday, Friday the 21st, um, at Udinese to complete a £7 million deal to see him go back to Italy. Um, firstly, one thing I do want to say, which I saw on Twitter, which I wasn't happy about, was I think it was a Hertfordshire Mercury put a tweet out saying Watford flop due to go back to Italy. I think that's very disrespectful. Passetto wasn't given a chance yeah. for whatever reason. His first touch in a Watford shirt or his first real contribution in a Watford shirt was a goal on clearance to win us a point, which, OK, meant nothing in the end, but it's a win us a point against Tottenham at home. Um, now, that that's an impressive debut. Uh, and he came come on a couple of times and he, he looked alive wire. He, he did look a little bit out of his depth, but to call him a flop when he didn't really get a chance, I think he's very, very disrespectful. Uh, so I'm very ashamed at, at the Hertfordshire Mercury there. But yes, uh, I, I wish him the best of luck to go back over them. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think it's really disrespectful to, to say that. Um, he, he's only had cameo appearances. It's, it's not his fault he's not been playing more. Um, he, I, I imagine he's doing his best in training and performing well in that. It's just the managers choose to play a different player instead of him. Um, when he came on, he, he looked lively, like you said. I don't think he created too many chances and as a winger you'd want to create chances but his work rate was brilliant and and like you say he literally came off the bench at Spurs two minutes later or it might not have been two minutes he cleared the ball off the line and that was a great impact yeah absolutely absolutely a big player next who definitely was involved and has been involved for the last few seasons 
uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how this one actually pans out, is Abdullah Decore. So we all know that Abdullah Decore hasn't made it a secret that if we were to go down, he would leave. Uh, and even if he were to stay up, he might want to leave and play Champions League football. They were his ambitions a couple of seasons ago. So now that we've gone down, it's been record- reported that he's actually agreed personal terms with Everton. However, a fee is yet to be agreed on. And we've actually rejected a £15 million bid from Everton. Now, this is the crazy part, right? Watford, by the way, value him at 20 to £25 million, which I'll get your opinion on in a minute, but uh, Ben. But personally, I think that's, that's about fair. But this is the crazy part, ladies and gents. Everton have reportedly said that the core will be on £120,000 a week. Right, the core is a good player, but I don't think he's... he's He's not worthy of 120 grand a week. And I think he'll struggle without a player such as Capu, a mould of Capu, next to him. So, firstly, Ben, do you think 20 to 25 million is reasonable? And secondly, what the bloody hell is going on offering 120 grand a week? <laughs> but yeah, 25 million um, for Decore, I think that's reasonable considering he, yes. he wasn't great last season. And, and we signed him for 8 million from Rennes as well. Um, so I think that twenty five million is quite fair for a, a player who he wasn't in great form last season, but but neither were we. To be fair, um, under the right coach, he could, and with a bit of momentum, he could maybe be a great signing for Everton. But he, he's not, nowhere near worth one hundred twenty thousand pounds a week, um, and it just shows how how far he's fallen really um, last season. Um, to think that he was being linked with big moves to PSG. And now he's in a bidding war with Everton, Wolves and Fulham. It's, uh, it's Two years ago, he had dreams of playing in the Champions League. Um, but I, yeah. I, I guess if you look at it, Gino Pozzo's got exactly what he wanted. He, he wanted a bidding war with Decore. He wasn't going to accept silly offer from Everton. Now it's just, let's see, he coughs up for 25 million. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for mentioning that, Ben. I did, uh, did forget to mention that. Fulham and Wolves are also monitoring... Uh, he, if I was Decore, I'd probably be looking at Wolves. You know, Wolves are a very, very solid team. They they, they challenge for Europe now. That's what they do. Uh, and they had a very good run in the Europa League this season. So I, I would be surprised um, if he was to choose Fulham. But, you know, if, if they want to offer him 120 grand a week at Everton, then so be it. But they paid 50 million for Richarlison. So we know that they splash stupid amounts of cash yeah. out. But let them do that. And we'll just cash in and laugh all the way to the bank. So, do you uh, think? One, do, you, talking... do you think we'll miss yes. Decore next season? Um, I, I, listen, right. Uh, what I've just said might sound like a completely shoving him out of the picture and completely like, giving him the cold shoulder. I do want to say that Decore, that first season when he got a full run of games, he was absolutely superb. He's been brilliant and whatnot. But I just think recently he's not looked at it. Um, so, do I think that we'd miss him? Uh, I think we've got players in there that can sort of fill the position. I think given a run of games, I think Chalabar can be that sort of moulder player. Uh, Will Hughes can play there as well. Uh, Kapu, yeah. if we keep hold of him. Tom Cleverley, if he keeps injury free, uh, he's another one. So, yeah, I, do, do I think we'll miss him? He has his moments of quality, but I, I think he's replaceable is the word I'll yeah, use. Yeah, definitely. He, he does... That's probably the way to use it. He does some things very well, doesn't he? And when he's on it, he's, 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 he completely dominate, dominates the opposition, doesn't he? But those games yeah. just don't seem to come round too often, did it, last season? But um, I, I think we potentially no. could miss him. But also, we've got the players who steps who can step up. Um, I've got some of the stats yeah. from Decore in his Watford career. So he's played 141 games for us, scored 17 yeah. goals and assisted 12. That's not too bad from a box-to-box to midfielder, is it? It's not. And, you know, when Pearson come in, we saw that he, he was sort of the player that would push further up and sort of almost at times play as a two alongside Troy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he he, he would push the, the defence, he would push the goalkeeper and try and sort of cut out the pass there, a bit like Gerard Delafeu would do uh, earlier in his Watford career. So, yeah, you know, there, there are certain aspects of his game that we will miss, but I also believe there's certain aspects that we've got the midfielders within the club to actually fill the void. So, yeah, it would be a shame to see him go, but I, I think it, it was it was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I think even if we did stay up. Um, 
Talking of Gerard Delafeu, he's another one. He's actually announced that he's going to be leaving Watford this summer, which it's not a massive surprise. I think we all knew that. And, you know, to, to have a player of his stature at the club, I think was was brilliant anyway. Um, I actually put a tweet out on my personal account when he sort of made the statement. And he's very frustrating to watch because it's, sometimes he does too much. But you can definitely see why he was on Barcelona's books. Uh, and it looks like he's going to be heading back to Spain or Italy. So he's going to be very sorely missed. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, Ben, but I think on his day, he's the difference of winning a match and losing a match. Definitely. Um, Delafay was the complete player for us. Um, he was our best outlet for goals and creativity. And I feel like when he suffered his ACL, we'd lack that. And he could have been the difference to keeping us in the Premier League. If we had his goals and creativity... Yep. He could lock on, uh, lock, uh, open up a defence. He could score the goals. Um, but look, we we knew it was coming with Delafeu. Um, but but knowing that he'll never, we'll never see him in a Watford shirt again hurts. Um, I truly believe yeah. that it. If he had been fit, we would have stayed up. But look, we, we've had a. a a fantastic player for us. I'll, I'll never forget the goal that he scored in the semi-final. Um, and to right. think he didn't even yeah. start that. He came off the bench. But yeah, he was just truly magic, weren't he? It was, what what a performance and what a player. And one of the best players I've seen in the, in the yellow shirt. Yeah, yeah. I think you've, you've just summed it up perfectly there. When Delafay has suffered his ACL, you know, you, you, it was so noticeable that we didn't have that player that was able to unlock the defence and sort of get round and create chances. It was so obvious. So it would have been interesting to see what would have happened come the end of the season uh, if we'd have stayed up. Yeah. Uh, if we'd have, if Delafay were kept fit, sorry. Uh, but it's all ifs and buts at the moment. Exactly. Uh, it's been a, it's so, been a pleasure yeah. to watch him, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. But then on other, you know, on the other hand, he, he was frustrating to watch at times, but more so than not, it was a joy to watch. Um, another player uh, who looks pretty much set to be out of the door is Danny Welbeck. And again, it's not a surprise. He's got a release clause of five and a half million, which when you buy a player for free, considering we bought him for free, to get five and a half million for him uh, for such a injury-prone player is a shrewd bit of business by the Potsos. And it's Southampton that are actually looking at him. Now, when this first come up, Ben, I always said to you, why, why would they want him? They've got Ings, but I think you've done a little bit more research and you, you've since sort of sussed that it, it would be to replace Shane Long. Yeah, it would, uh, Southampton play two up front, don't they? And yes, Shane Long doesn't get yeah. the goals, but he has the work rate. And if Southampton could maybe replace him with Danny Welbert, I think they would have the work rate and the goals on top of that. So I think it would be a shrewd bit of business from Southampton. And look, look that's great for Watford as well. We, we signed Welbert for free um, as a free agent after leaving yeah. Arsenal so if there is a clause in the contract to say that he's available for five and a half million I think that's that's a brilliant bit of business we we will miss him but like we've touched upon we've got uh, Luis Suarez who's came back from the line from Real Zavagoffa um, we don't know if Troy's going to stick around so um, yeah it'd be a shame yeah, to going to touch on that yeah um, yeah no completely agree um and I think he was on a pay-as-you-play um, contract as well, if memory serves me correctly. But I'm not 100% sure on that. So, <laughs> um, another one which was rumoured yesterday when we were doing the research for today's podcast, and it's since took another turn this morning, uh, Penaranda was rumoured to be on the verge of signing for the Turkish top flight side, and I think this is my best stab at pronouncing this correctly, but it's Yeni Malatayaspor, who are in the Turkish top flight. Um, now, obviously, we all know that Penaranda was subject to an eternal investigation for um, for something that happened over in Spain. And we don't know the outcome of the internal investigation. We don't even know if it started. Uh, but he's since this morning put on his Instagram story that he's not actually agreed to move anywhere. Uh, and I know, Ben, you were disappointed because you would have actually, you, you'd quite like to see him in the, the plans for this season, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I want to see him um, in a Watford shirt. I want to see him uh, perform. I want to see him do well for us. Uh, and it's, look, he's a very talented um, lad. I think he's he's been led astray 
on a few occasions. Um, but yes. look at what we've done in the championship before. I don't know if many people have watched it, but the Troy Deeney documentary on the Watford YouTube channel at the moment, they highlighted that we had Deeney, Vidra, Igalo, Forestieri. I think you need like four decent strikers. And they all got about over 15 goals that season. I'm not saying Penaranda yep. is going to get 15 goals, but I would put him in the category as similar to Forestieri. He's, he's not going to start every game but he's going to come on and he's going to cause defence problems. And I think that's where we're going to see Penaranda. And I, I want to see him involved this season. I, I think you're spot on with that comparison, Ben. You know, Forestieri, uh, you know, sort of towards the end of his Watford career and definitely at the start, he would be someone that, you know, you bring on when the defence is tired and he would unlock defences and create a lot of problems and very fast feet and whatnot. And we've seen... Slight glimpses of it. Uh, you know, he scored in the cup. Uh, was it last season he scored? Was it against Woking he scored? Or was that Will Hughes? Um, he, no, it was Will Hughes and Troy Deeney. Yeah, he scored, he, he scored at, uh, at home against Coventry um, in front of a That Vic. was the one. What, that was this season. Yeah, what a goal as well. Yeah, yeah, no, what a goal. So, hopefully, he uh, he is a very similar mould to Forestieri and he can get a run of games. So, but that's all the potential outgoings that we've heard of uh, as of yet as well. Um, and there's quite a few players in there, so we're probably thinking, okay, we, we, we're looking at a few players leaving. Um, it's a little bit quiet in terms of potential incomings, Ben. Um, there's there's two that I've put here. I uh, the reason I laugh found is another the one as one well. Make you laugh. Oh, okay. Well, I tell you what, we'll start with the Italian chap. Um, well, he's not Italian; he's Chilean. But we'll start with the chap coming in from Udinese. And then you can tell me about the one that you found as well, Ben. Um, we'll start with Francisco C- Sierra Alta, I believe I pronounced that correctly. He's 23. We don't know much on him, uh, if we're being honest. So this is going to be a very, very brief description. He's had loan spells. He's from Udinese, uh, which is brilliant, because we'll be bringing in an Udinese loan player and we're in the championship. All we need to do now is draw... Ian Holloway's Grimsby in the uh, FA Cup or Carabao Cup, and uh, it'll be like 2012 all over again, Ben. <laughs> um, but yeah, we he's 23, centre back, uh, loan spells at Parma and Empoli. He's actually been capped by the Chilean national team. Now, he came on as a sub in the 87th minute against Poland, and that was on the 8th of June uh, 2018. But he made his full sort of debut in a friendly against Papua New Guinea on the 15th of October 2019. Um, That's as much as I could find on him. So, you know, he's been capped once uh, in two years. So he's still very, very young. So it'd be interesting to see if he was to come over, if he's just defensive cover or if he's going to push for those starting positions. Um, but do you, do you think that he, he would be cover, or do you think that coming in, based on we don't know much upon him, do you think that he would be looking to start? Or what, what are your thoughts, if you have any, on this Sierra Alta uh, gentleman? Uh, from what I've seen, he, he's comfortable with his ball at his feet. I don't really think it's an upgrade on the central defence that we need. Um, I think no. he's going to come in and be back up. I can't really see him coming in and starting ahead of... Um, Craig Dawson and Ben Wilmot um, I'd even put maybe Cathcart there still as well um, so I think he'd, he's going to be back up yeah, yeah. Um, yeah he's, he's just going to start as a backup uh, defender for me um, don't really know too much about him so. um, to be fair so it's hard, it's hard to judge him and try and say how he fits in but we, we just don't know do we we could end up signing another three or four players from Indonesia as well <laughs> Yeah, I think we should just to just to pee the rest of the league off. It'd be brilliant bring, to see the reaction again. Bring back the Indonesia B team. Absolutely, absolutely. Go on then, Ben. You, you you've got you've got one. You, this is news to me as well, ladies and gentlemen. It's, so uh, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears, Ben. It's not really a player that is signing for Watford. Um, it's a player we was heavily linked with, and he's just signed a new contract. Um, so Matty Longstaff, we was linked with. Um, he was going to be a free agent at yes. the end of the season with Newcastle. Um, the link with Watford was that Undernese were going to sign him um, because then they didn't have to pay a com- uh, compensation fee. Uh, and then they was going to loan him to Watford potentially. Um, but I've seen this morning that he has just signed a new long-term contract with Newcastle. So that is another player that we're not looking at. <laughs> 
He he was. And what, what I found out about that whole thing was he was still on scholar wages, I think, at Newcastle. Yeah. And he was getting a good run of games, you know, him and his brother. But yeah, I think he, he would have known deep down that if he was to sign through the AZ, it's very, very likely that he would have ended up at Watford. Whether the relegation has sort of changed things yes. on that side of Yes, I thing, was going to bring that know. up, I reckon so. Yeah. Yeah, but best of luck to him at Newcastle. Very good young player. I'm, I'm sure it won't be the last that we see of him. Uh, and I'm sure he'll go on to bigger and better things. Um, the second one, which I, uh, I've written down here for potential incomings, and I, I just had to put it up. And do you know what? Credit to my brother. Uh, my brother messaged me to tell me that he'd done this player had done this interview. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spotted it. So, Cameron, if you're listening, um, you know, credit to you. We, we did put it out on social media as well, and we got a mixed response, I think is the best answer for that. Is and I can't believe I'm about to say this, Ben, but it's Yaya Torre, the 37-year-old midfielder from Man City. He's currently without a club, and he did an interview with Sky Sports recently, and he said, if a good team comes in for me, I would love to stay. Um, I'd love to be in London. I would love an opportunity for Championship or Premier League club. It seems mad to be even entertaining this, but based on his experience that he would bring, would you actually take a punt on him? Would you say, yeah, yeah, come in for a year, help mentor the young kids, uh, you'll get the odd game here and there, you know, do you want to do it? Or do you think that we just stay clear, our wages would be too high, he might want to play week in, week out, and he'd be potentially taking up another young player's, um, you know, spot? Um in two minds, really. Um, I would love a Yaya Torre of maybe 30 years of age, um, not 37. Yeah. Um, also, I wouldn't want him to join purely because I think he could stop the development of younger players playing first-team football, and that's what they need, especially the likes of Quinner. But Quinner's probably licking his lips at the moment, thinking Decore's on his way, and he's like, right, uh, start the season comes, I'm going to probably play the um, majority of the games. And then if we sign Yaya Torre, he's like on the phone to the agent say, look, try and get me a move. I, I'm not going to play this season. So I don't really want him to join Watford, to be fair. And if you look at the interview, what he said, there's one bit that he said, and it says to me, he's not going to join us. He says, if a good team comes in. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, I think, I, I don't want to say this. Uh, I've had my view on how I think we'll do this season, but I think, a lot of outsiders looking in, and the bookies certainly suggest this, a lot of p- people are tipping us to go straight back up. So if you're going to look at a championship club to go to, and it's near London, then Brentford's, Watford's, you know, they're the sort of teams that you're going to be looking at. Yeah. But I'd be very surprised if he joins. And the other thing as well, Ben, is it looks like Capoo's going to be staying, although he was linked with a move to Valencia, which I think he's a non-starter. Um, with Capu staying, you would expect that he would be the experienced one in midfield to be playing and sort of help that young player alongside him. So I'd be very surprised if we then opted for uh, Etienne Capu and Yaya Torre in the Championship. I just don't think it would work. Um, but uh, it, it's brilliant to, to, to sort of come up with these rumours sometimes and just also even entertain talking about it. It'd be absolutely crazy. But I agree. Yaya Toure, 30 years old, I would take. But 37, I think for the purpose of the development of the younger players that we've got coming through, I, I, I don't think it, it would be a very wise move. And I'm sure Mr Pozzo, uh, Mr. Pozzo is also thinking that because we, uh, we put it out on Twitter uh, and Instagram. And on the Instagram post, uh, there was a lot of people tagging the official Watford uh, actual page. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully, hopefully they haven't uh, taken too much notice. But... Um, yeah, that, that's as much as we've got incomings. It, it, it's it's very quiet at the moment, but I I trust the Pozzos. I, I I believe they know what they're doing. They they, they want to go in under the radar, and we'll get the players in. You know, we, we we've got two weeks until that first friendly against Tottenham, uh, and then we've got three weeks until the opening fixture against Middlesbrough. So I would like to think that Mister Pozzo knows what he's doing in terms of bringing players in at the right time. Uh, at least I hope he does. But in his statement, he certainly said he knows what we need to do to get back up. So, fingers crossed, he knows what he's doing. But I think the most appropriate thing to end the podcast on, and I'm sure you'll agree, Ben, is the interview that Troy Deeney did with Talk Sport on Thursday. Um, it, 
was sort of announced, well, not announced, but Adam Leventhal reported on The Athletic uh, that Troy Deeney was looking to leave Watford. Um, and we sort of thought that might be the case. He's been at the club for 10 years. Ben mentioned earlier that we've had three amazing uh, you know, documentaries on Troy on the Watford YouTube. If you haven't checked them out already, go and have a look. The third one was out last night. It's a brilliant watch. Uh, I love Troy Deeney. You know, he's a local lad to me. Um, and it, that 10 years, considering that we'd just been relegated, the interview he did with Sky Sports after the Arsenal game, I think everything pointed to him leaving. Uh, Troy Deeney then goes on the breakfast um, sort of show with Talk Sport with Jamie O'Hara and Alan Brazil. Uh, and he said the following. He says, I won't actively look to leave. Watford is my club. I could have gone to Leicester after they, won the, after they won the Premier League and played Champions League football. If I didn't leave then, why would I want to leave now? But if the club wants to move on, then that's OK with me. I'm a big boy. I will take it on the chin. Now, Ben, we both have the same view on this, but I'm going to ask you, and you, you can express the view that we've got. Do you think Troy knows what he's doing when he's saying that? Yeah, um, Troy's not stupid. He's not going to go on national radio and say... Um, yes, I am. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm looking for offers. Um, slip into my DMs and I'll um, see what you're offering me. And yeah, I'll turn up Monday and I'll join your club. Um, it's not stupid. It's not going to say that. He's the captain of a football club. It looked really bad on him if he came out and said he was looking for a move. Um, so Troy said all the right things as a captain. Um, I believe he, if the right offer comes in for Troy, he, he will look to move. Um, it's also... Worth noting that Watford might look to move him on. You've got to remember, Troy Dean is in his last year of his contract with Watford now. Um, so if there is a chance to get anything from a sale of Troy Dean, I think the Pozos will take it. Yeah, uh, and I, I think the, the two rumoured clubs, which are the two most rumoured clubs when it comes to Troy Dean being linked with a move, which he has been for the last eight years, I think every transfer window he's been linked with a move, is Burnley and West Brom. Now, West Brom would make sense because he's a Brummie, he's a Midlands lad. Uh, and Burnley would make sense because Sean Deutsch was a real manager, like the first real manager that he flourished under, um, as, as you would have seen in the Troy Deeney documentary. Um, and they, no disrespect to Burnley, but they play sort of football. He, he, would, he would do well in that sort of team. If he was, if he is to leave, Ben, uh, I'll, I'll just ask you this quickly. How much, considering I believe it was 20 or 30 mil that we turned down for him from Leicester, but that was a few years ago. Um, that was five years ago, I think, from memory. If he was to move, how much do you think would be a reasonable amount to get for Troy Deeney, considering he's been at the club for 10 years and done what he's um, done? I think some people won't like this estimation, but you've you got to take into account that he's, what is he, 30, how old is he, Thirty. 32. 32 years of age. He's in his last year of his contract. Um, between 5 and 10 million, I'll say. Ooh, I, I don't know if I'd go as low as 5. I think 10 million would... But, you know, it, I think what we have to remember as well is that the coronavirus is going to take a massive yeah. hit on transfer budgets and transfer um, you know, fees. Uh, like Nathan Ake, for example, I, I believe he would have gone for a lot more had coronavirus not had struck. But, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a shame to see him leave. He is Mr Watford he, and he, he he won't want to leave as well. I think deep down he, he won't want to leave. He's got to look at it from a sort of financial side of things. Yes, he's been on a very cushy contract at Watford. You know, I'm sure he's getting paid. Play, I'm sure he's getting paid, easy for me to say, um, a pretty penny by Watford. Yeah. And I'm sure he's had all sorts of goal bonuses. But he's 32 now. He, Realistically, he's got what the best part of three three years at a push, maybe in, in professional yeah. football. He's, if there's a if there's a move for him in if there's a move for him in the Premier League, he's going to take it for financial That's reasons. Uh, and I, I can't I can't blame him for that. He, he's been a brilliant servant to the club. He really really has. Yeah. Um, and if he does leave, me and Ben have talked about it, and I'm sure we'll talk about it some more, sort of behind the microphones. But. Um, I'd, I'd I'd absolutely love to dedicate an episode just to Troy Deeney. He he's that sort of 
that sort of player at a club, and I'd be very, very sad yeah, to see him go. Yeah, definitely. I just want to point out as well, uh, I think some, some Watford fans need to remember just how much Troy has actually done for this football club. Yes. And some of the disrespect being thrown his way is uncalled for. And also tagging him into the post or even his partner into the post, it's just disrespectful. And I don't think he deserves what he's getting at the moment. You've got to remember what he's done for us over the last 10 years. Um, I would also like to see uh, Watford arrange a testimonial for him when everyone's allowed back in the ground as well because he is a true club legend and he, he deserves a good send-off yeah. if he is to part ways with us. Yeah, and uh, do you know what, Ben? I'm so, so glad that you mentioned that because I completely forgot that some of the abuse that he was been getting this season, um, you know, he, he can take it well. We, we've seen what sort of character that Troy Dean is sort of moulded into and I'm sure he can take it well. But he, you don't want to see, he's a captain at the end of the day. He's done what he's done for the club. He's, you know, completely turned his life around since he got, you know, sent to prison all those years ago. So to, to see some of the abuse that he's been getting, it, it, it's not yeah, definitely. On. And I, I, I'm not a big, I, I'm not a fan of it at all. And some of the posts I'm seeing, I, it, it's just, it's horrible to yeah. see. Um, but yeah, testimonial, I think would be great. I, I think it would be quite appropriate to arrange it against either Warsaw or Birmingham City, seeming as though that it's, that's yeah. his club. Um, uh, and I, I think a testimony would be very appropriate. But yeah, I, I think that's the possibly the most appropriate thing we've ended the podcast on, ladies and gents. Um, the most sobering as well. You know, it's, it's, it's a shame to talk about him leaving. Um, I don't know if you've got any final thoughts on Troy Deeney, Ben? Um, I just think it's it's a, it's a two way thing, really. If Troy wants to move on, we respect it. He, he's done so much for the club. We shake hands and we just part ways. But he would always be welcomed back to Watford. And I can imagine that 100%. if he does move on, we could probably see him behind the scenes at Watford again. And um, he's touched upon saying that he's doing his coaching badges at the moment. So whether he further down the lines, he looks after the under-23s or if he ends up moving into the management. Um, I, it won't be the last we do see of Troy Deeney if he is to move on this summer. Absolutely. Completely agree. And what a brilliant way to end the podcast. So, um, just before we do go, I do want to remind you that we do have a competition running at the moment, which runs uh, up until five o'clock on Saturday, the 29th of August. Uh, it's on our Twitter and Instagram over at Voices of the Vic on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, it's from a uh, absolutely brilliant artist, uh, Charlie Paints Things. It's two simple steps. Retweet the post on Twitter and follow. Make sure you're following us and Charlie Paints Things and her Twitter is in the link. Uh, and over on Instagram, if you like the post and follow, make sure you follow both us and Charlie Paints Things as well. And drop a little comment in the comment section just to say that you've done it. Um, we've had some uh, a lot of entries um, going in, but we've still got another week until that competition closes. So we'll announce a winner as and when the competition closes. But as always, you know, I, I seem to say this an awful lot, but the, the only reason I say this a lot is because we genuinely cannot thank you enough. We, we Me and Ben, you don't realise how much we've talked uh, away from the podcast this week, just talking about what we've got planned. There'll be, a, um, keep your ears peeled as well, or ears to the ground, I should say, next week. There'll be a new sound to the voices of the Vic. That's as much as I'll say. We're looking forward to what's coming up. We've got some brilliant stuff planned and we cannot thank you enough for the listening. Like me and Ben, are, are, we're absolutely blown away, aren't we, Ben, by the interaction we get in and the the, the figures that we get in. And yeah, we, we, it's just not what we imagined, is it, Ben? Not at all. It's just two mates talking football, got bored during lockdown and it's it's really taken off for us. Yeah. And we really appreciate everyone that listens. Um, so if anyone's got any feedback as well, they want us to try this or try that or they don't want us to do something look we want to hear from you we want to hear what your thoughts are of the podcast but from our point of view we absolutely love doing this and we'll carry on doing this until um until we're probably too old enough to do it (laughs) yeah yeah well i'll worry about you then ben (laughs) i had to sneak that in there mate. Uh, i knew it was coming i set you up (laughs) you opened yourself up mate yeah you've 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 Teed the ball in an open goal there for me, (laughs) mate. But, yeah, no, thank you very much, ladies and gents. And we'll be with you again to speak about the Middlesbrough home game. And then, obviously, we'll be able to talk about the Tottenham uh, game as well that happens behind closed doors. So, yeah, thanks again for listening. And we'll speak to you next time.